Hi there. One can't believe it, but we're on the 10th episode of the Brain Power Seminar. We've looked at nine other subjects before this, and uh, we've got a very interesting one for, uh, for this episode. We've um, looked at the last time at uh, your brain or the belly. It's your choice. It really connects to the session of, uh, of this episode. Um, we, we're going to look at your brain, intimacy, and seduction. Now, I can just imagine you saying, especially if it's the first time you look at this, uh, at, at this brain power seminar, and you would say, what does sex or seduction or intimacy have to do with, with your brain? Well, we found that it is a frontal lobe hit. When you have sexual arousal outside of marriage, science tells us that that, that does have an effect on the, your frontal lobe especially. Let's just share some brain facts. One of them is that the transmission of speed, of the speed of nerve impulses, is about 120 milliseconds. Now, if you calculate that, that's about 430 kilometers per hour. This is the speed that these messages are transmitted into the brain. We've got a real good brain. God has given us such a wonderful brain. To recap a little bit, let's look at the anatomy of, of a habit. We have seen that senses would stimulate the thoughts and uh, that would be filtered through either principles or feelings. That would lead to an action and that action would leave me with a response, a feeling, a feeling of okay or not okay. That will determine if this habit is a good habit or, not, or, a, or a bad habit. We also need to re be reminded that our habits form our character. And the only thing I can take to heaven is my character. The good news is, in this habit cycle, I could cut out of it. I could clutch out of it by, by using another habit that would become the dominant one. And if I, for 23 times, use this other one, I would actually relay this neuro pathway so that another habit, a better one, would be the most dominant one. We also looked at the pain-pleasure principle. And we found that the most two common pleasurable activities that tend to be addictive is appetite and it is sex. With this session, we're going to look at sex, intimacy, and the, the whole aspect around this in connection with our brain. Well, this is a, a very triggering word, sex. And uh, let me share a verse with you in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 18 before we start in the anatomy of this whole process. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside of the body. But he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Well, it's a profound text. The question is, Human sexuality, is it good or is it bad? We grow up with a certain perspective of this issue. You know, we could have been taught sex is not good and uh, we go into life with that. Or we could have been taught, you know, you could do this anytime, anywhere, anybody, anything. You know, there's, there's, this is quite, has quite a profound effect on the brain at the end of the day. Well... The question is, is sex good or is it bad? It's definitely good. And I know all men would agree with me and say, wow, this is the greatest thing that could ever happen in your life. Well, especially and specifically in a loving marriage relationship. Sex is good in a loving marriage relationship. It bonds two people together. It makes two one, and God declares they are one. This is what really puts this act together. This is what puts this relationship together. It also perpetuates the species, something God 
really intended to happen. Let's look at a natural sex syndrome with this episode. Let's focus on it. We have seen that always a stimuli will lead to a response. So uh, the stimuli would lead to a specific response, feeling after the action. Now, what would be the stimuli when we look at the natural sex syndrome? It might be hormones. It will be hormones. It might be sight. It might be what I hear. It could be smell. It could be any of those, of those um, things that we, that we, that we experience, um, our senses. That would stimulate this action, this cycle. That would lead to sex drive. Normally, when there was sight or year or hormones getting active, that would lead to the sex drive where yeah, there's a need for that now. And when it's in a loving relationship, when I'm married and uh, we have chosen not to have this act when we're not married, this cycle would carry on and we would have the sex act or we won't have the sex act when I'm not married. The outcome, the response would be satisfaction. If I'm not married, I don't go through this emotion. I stop, I delay because I am not married to one specific loving partner. The response would be satisfaction. If I go through this process, I am married, I would have the sex act, I would feel satisfied. My spouse will feel satisfied. We will feel complete. And the cycle is complete. God is in the cycle. I want to share with you the unnatural sex syndrome. Something that we see happening in our society more and more and more. Now the stimuli would be hormones, yes, and the sight would be there, and the hearing and the smell and all of those things would be there. That would lead to, lead to sex drive. But there's another component that we see in a unnatural sex syndrome. The component of, yeah, fantasy. Fantasy starts playing a role in the unnatural sex syndrome. Well, sex drive leads to uh, a need, and that will lead to the act. Now, in an unnatural sex syndrome, it could be an act with somebody that I am not married to. It could lead to an act of masturbation. It could e lead to an act of, you know, affairs. Something that I do while I'm married with somebody that I'm not married. It could lead to porn, to homosexuality. And there's a whole string of things that we're not even going to mention or show uh, with, with, this, um, with this program. But that leads to a very interesting response. The response after I've had an act... That is not in God's love, not in God's plan for me as a human being. It leads to an act of guilt. It leads to an act of fear. Fear that somebody would find out about this. It would lead to being ashamed um, and even anxiety. And that leads to another very, very serious thing. Many a times it leads to Something like abuse. Um, it leads to anger. It leads to, to self-mutilation, eating disorders, and even, you know, hitting and raping. Um, it's a form of, of self-punishment, if I may. You see, when I have had an act with somebody, in an affair, whatever, I come home, I open the gate to drive my car in the driveway and our little fox terrier comes, you know, and little dogs, they come and jump up and they say, hello, my bossy, I'm so glad you're at home. And I, because of the feeling I have, this feeling of guilt, this feeling of, you know, yeah, anxiety, fear, um, not feeling good with myself, frustrated, I would kick the dog, chow, 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 and fox terrier would go there um, 
And then the wife would come out and say, Why are you, you kicking my dog? And because she's lashing at me, I will feel better because um, I'm actually the one that's not feeling good. And this is a vicious cycle that we, we normally go in. This could be the same with, you know, raping somebody, you know, hurting somebody. And even if justice, and especially when justice comes, I feel that, uh, you know, it, it, it's okay because, you know, I, 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 I feel guilty. I feel it, it covers that up. It covers that up. And eating disorder does the same thing. Or mutilation where I found many, especially young people, they cut themselves with blades and so on. And that pain causes them to have a feeling of, you know, I, I'm punished now and it's okay. But it's not okay. You see, the cycle just goes on and on and on. And it draws deeper and deeper. And the X becomes weirder and weirder and weirder. It's really a crazy cycle. The only way to clutch out of this spiral is to face consequence, to face, even if it may, punishment for an act that is out of God's will. Now, only when I face consequence, only when I paid the price, only when I, you know, I was punished in, 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 in a just way, I would feel that okay feeling, that reconciliation feeling only then. Now, when we look at the anatomy of a habit and we see this cycle of, of, of a habit, then we, we start realizing what happens here. I'm going to have this response of okay with others, okay with myself, okay with God. The moment I go out of God's will, there's a feeling of not okay. Not okay with myself. I'm not okay with others. I might be in a relationship with somebody outside of my marriage. Not okay with them. Not okay with God because God has not put this together. I'm not going to feel okay. Now, this, the physiology of a faulty sexual conditioning is really very important to look at. Before we go there, I need to just make mention, going back to the unnatural sex syndrome, that there's a, there's a very important thing that we need to just emphasize here. The moment we want to get out of this cycle, we need to face consequence. We need to face the price. I, I want to give you this example. I was a pastor of a church. And there was an elder in this church that did duty as an elder even on the, on the pulpit uh, with me as the pastor. And this specific weekend when we did the divine service, he was, he was there. He did, this, he did the, the prayer on the pulpit. On Monday, I got a call from a daughter of his, and she asked me to come home and come and see them as a family. And she said, there's something very serious that came up, and we, we need your help to deal with this. When I got there, I got the shock of my life because it was not only the daughter, it was of this elder, it was her, uh, her, her older sister and her younger sister and all of their daughters. Now, the one had two daughters, the other one had three daughters, and the other one also had two daughters. So all of these ladies were there, and I'm the only man there, and they're saying to me, there's something bad that has happened. We don't want, uh, you know, I sort of asked, can I bring Elder with? No, no, this is serious stuff. We need to speak to you, Pastor, alone. And so I got there and I got all these ladies. And yeah, the story comes out that this Elder has sexually abused each one of these daughters' children. So the daughters, the grandchildren, each one of them at certain age, he abused every one of them at a certain age. And the last one came out with the story and exposing this whole lifestyle that went around where this 
opa and somebody that should protect little children. He was having acts with these little kids at a certain age. Now the question is, what should one do? And you know, what effect does this have on the brain at the end of the day? Well, we know, science say, sexual arousal outside of marriage is really a frontal lobe hit. Well, I've learned in the hard way that if this person does not face the consequence, is not punished for the act that is out of the will of God and even out of the will of our country's laws, this person would never find reconciliation, would never have an okay feeling. So what is my responsibility? In a case like this where minors are involved, we need to report this and have a process going where we help this person to face consequence, to pay the price so that he or she would be free to have reconciliation and feel okay again. The moment this elder would face the consequence of him really going against God's will and facing the consequence maybe being punished, only then would he have reconciliation in his own life. Now, what's very important for us to know is that this is a whole process. You see, the most common sexual acts that we find in today's society is something like masturbation. Now, you know, when I mention this word, some people really, their hair goes up straight. Because there's such mixed feelings about this subject. I've heard, I've seen, I walked into a situation in, uh, in one part of our country where a medical professional, a nurse, was actually demonstrating to young girls how to masturbate so that they would be safer when it comes to HIV AIDS and transmission of this virus. The other one is homosexuality, and there's heterosexuality, and the list actually goes on. We're just going to look at, at these basically. Let's look at the anatomy of a faulty, faulty sexual conditioning. You see, when it comes to masturbation, I want to make a few statements. Puberty sets in at the age of 8 to 12 nowadays. When you go back 30, even more years back, we find, and I ask this in all my audiences, when you think back, when did we get to puberty? And they would say, well, it was like 14, 15, 16 years old. Today's reality is it's 8 to 12 years that we get to puberty. That means it's difficult to refrain from sex activity until the marriage of 20, 30, you know, that period. So we get involved with this. And yeah, the media and all of that is telling us, we should do this. We should go for this. Well, masturbation is the first form of sexual activity. And the fact is, we're equipped to do it. We have the privacy to do it. And in, as I explained, in some cultures, in some circumstances, even encourage to do this. Now, masturbation is not very satisfactory uh, at the end of the day. If you would compare this with an act with your, your spouse that you are in love with, it's like, you know, learning to swim by correspondence. It's really not satisfying. It's not really not uh, working. It needs to be activated or, you know, another syndrome needs to be acted on to get this whole act together. And so fantasy comes in here. So, you know, we look at... Uh, you know, media, we looked at pornography, we look at literature, we look at uh, pictures to, to really activate this whole thing and get this ball going. Very, very important that we realize that this whole onset of puberty, that so much early in life, is because of many times the lifestyle that we follow. We have not had such a big impact of, um, of a protein diet in the, in the years past. 
protein. Meat was used as a, as a flavorant. It wasn't used as the food. Today we invite people for a barbecue. We invite them for a poiki. And we know what's going to be in there. That is what it's about. And we find the way that they feed the animals, a lot of hormones, a lot of things that would really activate uh, the, the growth and really get this animal to be big and strong and fat very quickly. We find we eat that. This hormones is in this system and it actually really shortens the period up to where puberty should actually start. And that has a whole commotion. People, what we eat, this is what we are. We need to start looking at this from a, from a, from a, from a different vantage point. I want to just give you a few pointers on how to change a habit. Start with accepting a promise from the one who is bigger than us. You know, God said, no temptation shall take you but what is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above what you are capable of. And with the temptation also will make a way to escape so that you may be able to bear it. I love God for this. He says, I'm not going to tempt you above what you can handle. I want to just take you to another very important principle, and that is we need to make a decision beforehand around this whole sexuality thing. You see, if I set myself up for success with this, I have a better chance. Let's look at an example. Um, if I think of the Bible, there's quite a few examples, but let's look at Joseph. Joseph was in a position where, where he, he, he could have been in big trouble. Uh, he was left alone at Potiphar's house, and he was put in charge of the whole household. When Potiphar left, his wife took the chance to seduce Joseph. And she used every opportunity to say to him, Come on, Boyki, I'm ready for you. Joseph could have reasoned in his mind. And you see, this is the mind games that we sometimes find playing as we are bombarded with, you know, desensitized things like, you know, sex is okay. You know, every scene that we see on television, it's about, it's about that, immorality. He could, have, he could have reasoned and say, okay, Potiphar said, I must um, pay the servants, I must feed the animals, I must service the, you know, the chariots. He could have just said to himself, well, Potiphar's wife, she needs servicing. I, you know, I could, you know, she's a possession. You know, in that time, the wife was a possession. So I'm just servicing her. I'm doing him a favor. Just imagine what would have happened if he, if he just reasoned that way. But he, he acted on principle. What does the principle say? Joseph said in his mind, I am not going to sin against God. That led him to run when this wife he said of Potiphar said, Come on, boy. And I think she exposed herself saying, I'm ready for you. And he ran. He ran for safety. People, if he would have looked at feelings, if we would have acted around feelings instead of principle, he would have been in trouble. The principle says, if it's not in God's will, run. It is not safe if, it is, if it's not in God's will. We need to call the feelings and the lost response by name. If I feel guilty, if I feel anxious about this, anxious to myself, to others, then it's not good. I should just avoid it. It's not going to be good. I need to trace this thinking back to what determined this feelings. You know, the way we grow up, how we see things, that would make a big difference. And then we need to use the memory to relive the events in life which produce a thinking that pr produce this feelings of not okay. And then as we identify this, we need to identify the, 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 the pain pleasure principle in here. If, you know, I could have five minutes of good feeling with somebody that I'm not married, but it could lead me to a lifetime of pain with an unwanted child or a sexual transmitted disease or anything like that. Really not worth it. And then we need to establish the great 
principles to replace the faulty one. You see, the principle is, I am not going to sin against God. It means when I sin against God, I sin against myself. That's what the biblical verse said earlier in this episode. That he means I've actually sinned against that person as well. God, that person, even myself. We need to be alert that thinking and feeling are very uh, susceptible, susceptible to previous conditioning. I could be conditioned in the wrong way. And then we need to familiarize ourselves with our own stimuli. You know, there's a, there's a stimuli response pattern. You know, my thinking, my feeling, my behavior, my consequences, I need to look at that whole package in, in this whole process. And um, I want to share this, um, this beautiful um, explanation uh, that the Lord gives us in His, uh, in His Word. And uh, we, we find this uh, specific verse in Isaiah 57 verse 18. It says, and, and, and this is the Lord speaking, He says, I have seen your ways. I've seen that you've acted out of my will, but I will heal you. I will also lead you. I will restore your comforts to you. You see, the Lord, right now, as you look at this, He knows what you've done. Nobody else might know, but He knows what you've done. And you might sit there with guilt feelings. You might be frustrated with yourself. You might feel ashamed. You might feel fear because somebody might find out what you've done. You might have committed adultery. You, you, are, you might be busy with a sin out of the will of God. And my prayer is that you will respond now. Don't leave this to another time. That you would respond at this moment and saying, Lord, here I am. I'm taking this promise. You said you have seen my ways. Lord, please heal me. Please restore my comforts to me. I really need that. I want to challenge you with that. In our next little episode, we're going to look at who's in charge in this whole process. Who's in charge? May God bless you as you make decisions for Him. And that would affect your brain to be soaring like an eagle rather than scratching like a chicken. Stay healthy. Stay wise. Until the next episode, God bless you.